The GameCube is one of my favorite systems of all time, so naturally a top 10 on my favorites had to be made. This list is based off of how much fun the games are and how often I see myself coming back to playing them. Keep in mind, I haven't played every big GameCube game like Animal Crossing or Paper Mario a Thousand Year Door, so those won't be on the list. I apologize in advance, I just simply never got around to playing those. But without further ado, let's -a go! The game to launch this list is actually one of the GameCube launch titles, Madden NFL 2002, baby! Truly, no other game even stood a chance, man. Well, okay, I guess Luigi's Mansion is a bit better, but only a touch. Anyway, seeing Nintendo make a Luigi exclusive game and spotlight it as a launch title for the GameCube was a very left field move. Perhaps this was done because they were worried about the sales of the game, so they pushed it for a day one release so more people would buy it? I don't know, that's just a theory. Now, I know that some aren't that big a fan of Luigi's Mansion, but I honestly think it's a really solid and underrated title. I've recently played through it for a top 10 last year, which by the way, you should totally watch, but I just love the concept. Concept. Mario has been kidnapped for a change, so Luigi has to go into a spooky mansion to save his brother. As you would expect, the house is filled with ghouls and ghosts, but thankfully, EGAD equips Luigi with the Poltergust 3000 to suck them up. So you go around the mansion, sucking up ghosts, solving puzzles, and collecting treasure. The soundtrack is pretty fantastic, too. It really alludes to the fact that you're trapped in a creepy mansion. And of course, with that Nintendo charm, Luigi will sometimes hum the tune while he's creeping around the mansion. It's honestly brilliant. You rarely see games do stuff like this. Catching ghosts has to be my favorite part because it's not as easy as just pushing a button. You have to expose their heart or soul to light, leaving them vulnerable. And then there's a struggle to suck them up entirely. Every room you encounter is filled with tons of rich details and interactive environment pieces, which was actually a pretty mind-blowing feature back in 2001. The reason this game is so high on my list is because I don't really see myself going back to it for maybe another few years, but it is one that I recommend every everyone try for themselves. Of the bigger Nintendo franchises, Metroid is the one I've played the least. Well, I've played like Zero Animal Crossing, Fire Emblem, and Xenoblade, but whatever, whatever, you get my drift. I've really only poured a few hours into Metroid Fusion, but that was several years ago. Up until recently, at least, I finally tried Metroid Prime to see what all the fuss was about. And man, was I missing out. Metroid Prime is one of the best transitions from 2D to 3D that any game franchise has ever seen. Outside of Zelda and Mario doing a pretty outstanding job, too. At the beginning, you get access to all of Samus's powers, but then an explosion knocks her against the wall and she loses all of them. Then you're left with, well, pretty much nothing. But that's a great thing, because it incentivizes the player to explore the huge, rich worlds to find all her powers again. Because you slowly gain her powers back, it allows you to become accustomed with each of them as well. And from there, you explore lots of land, shoot down baddies and bosses, and find all sorts of upgrades and secrets. The exploration is fantastic. The whole game is very immersive thanks to all the small sound effects added from the environment and the fact that you're playing through Samus's helmet the whole time. Now, a big part of the game is scanning stuff, which I honestly wasn't that big a fan of. Sometimes scanning objects allowed you to make progress, but other times it just felt kind of useless. Maybe I'd be more into it if I previously played Metroid and wanted to learn more about the lore, but as a newcomer, I felt it was a bit excessive. And the backtracking. I, I actually really enjoyed it. I know people complain about the backtracking a lot in games like this, but I thought it was really satisfying seeing how jam-packed the world was. Like, I actually enjoyed getting lost. And that's gonna happen a lot, let me tell you. Because the world around you feels so alive, exploring it is really fun. Metroid Prime is relatively high on this list because it's not really my favorite genre, so to speak. I'd rather play something more simple, but that's just me. But I can totally understand why this or Metroid Prime 2 would be lower on others' lists. This was actually the first Mario Party game I ever played, Mario Party 4. I still remember going to a friend's house when I was like 8 years old, and we Mario partied for like 6 hours straight. Man, those sure were the days. So simple, so easy. Ah. Now, this isn't my favorite Mario Party of all time, but I think it's the best one on the GameCube. There really isn't too much different from this game compared to the others, outside of the obligatory new boards and minigames. Now, sure, the boards are fully rendered in 3D now, and you can team up in pairs with Party Mode, but it still feels like classic Mario Party. I especially love the items that you can use. My favorite has to be the Mega Mushroom. Not only do you grow giant in size, but you can roll additional dice 
face. And if you pass anyone on the board, you smash them into the ground with your feet. It's so satisfying, let me tell you. And the mini games are some of my absolute favorites the franchise has ever offered. You've got so many greats like Three Throw, The Great Deflate, Dungeon Duos, Trace Race, Cliffhangers, and of course, Book Squirm. Book Squirm alone puts this game on the list. I've never enjoyed a mini game so much in my life. The pure ingenuity of pages crashing down to top players with small holes to escape blows my mind still to this day. And look at that box art, it is just popping with enjoyment. I don't know what it is, but this is like my favorite Mario Party box art ever. While I've never played the first Pikmin, I've had a blast playing Pikmin 2. I only recently tried this one, and I gotta say this didn't look like the kind of game that I was gonna enjoy. But 20 hours later, I'm still enjoying it quite a bit. In Pikmin 2, you take control of Captain Olimar and Louie, and go around on a day-by-day -day basis collecting Pikmin, fighting hidden artifacts, defeating enemies, going through caves, and the likes. The goal is to collect 10,000 coins because the Hakatate Fright is in debt, and that's the ultimate objective. For how cute Pikmin 2 is, the game itself is surprising surprisingly deep, especially for a Nintendo game. The Pikmin are categorized by color and all have different features. The blue Pikmin can swim through water, the purple are slow but incredibly strong, the white can destroy poisonous clouds, and so on and so forth. Let me tell you, the Pikmin you collect basically become a new family member, because when one of them dies, it is the most guilty, gut-wrenching feeling of all time. And this game is not that easy. You gotta be really careful with which Pikmin you use to attack and how much you use. The puzzles are really clever and well thought out too. They aren't impossible by any stretch, but they do require a bit of thought to figure out. In terms of replay value, you'll be playing this for a long time seeing how much content has been jammed into it. There's also an additional challenge mode where you can complete more caves in a two-player battle that I didn't get to try. But alas, I feel like this is another game that I probably won't go back to for some time, just like Luigi's Mansion. But seriously, I was addicted to this one, and it's a shame Nintendo has yet to release Pikmin 4, at least during the time this video was created. Some of you may not believe this, but people weren't the biggest fans of The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker when it first came out. Yeah, I'm not joking. People criticized it because of how cartoony it looked. I mean, I don't know about you, but looking at The Wind Waker and Twilight Princess on the GameCube, I'd say visually this one has aged much, much better. But enough talk about the graphics, let's get on with the gameplay. The Wind Waker is a lot like the other Zelda titles where you run around discovering new areas, whacking enemies with a sword, finding things to blow up, solving puzzles, and the whole shebang. I especially love the controls in the Wind Waker. Movement feels so crisp and it's a lot of fun attacking. All the items you'll use are a blast. I especially love gliding around with the Deku Leaf. It's so much fun. I know a lot of people complain about having to travel across the sea so much, and I can completely understand that complaint. But honestly, the sailing really makes the Wind Waker stand out above the other Zelda titles. You truly feel like you're going on an adventure when you literally have to sail from island to island. And the music accompanied with it just makes it all the better. There's a reason this was remade in HD. Even though I wouldn't say that was completely necessary, but still. Oh hell yeah, now we're getting to the real bangers, and I'm probably gonna get crucified for not considering all the games above as bangers, but that's okay, I'm used to it. Super Monkey Ball 2 isn't praised nearly enough, okay? This is a game that I can come back to at least once a year, if not more, because it's just that fun. The gameplay is simple, you control a monkey and have to navigate yourself around stages to reach the goal, except instead of moving the monkey, you move the stage. Monkey Ball 1 is very similar to its sequel, but it's missing a lot of new modes and overall better games gameplay mechanics. Like in Monkey Ball 1, if you want to unlock Master Mode, you have to play all 50 expert stages and you could only lose a few lives. Yeah, now that's just a joke. In Monkey Ball 2, you just need to build up experience and you can rack up 99 lives and you'll basically be good to go. Plus, there's way more mini games, including some of my all-time favorites like Monkey Billiards. There's also a story mode, which really isn't any different from the normal game, but it comes with the most cheesy cutscenes you'll ever see, so that's a plus in my book. The greatest part of the game is the control and stages. The precision is beyond fantastic. Moving works on the dime, and it needs to because the stages can get insanely difficult. I mean, t t look at this. Like, wh what? Wh what even is that? Like, honestly, I... I I don't know. And also, I gotta give a special shout out to Monkey Ball 2 because this was the game that launched my channel back in 2011. That's right, I used to have Monkey Ball 2 Let's Plays and it was that series where I started to gain subscribers, but those videos have been removed and put on my second channel. But that's besides the point, go play Monkey Ball 2 or at least the first one if you haven't already. 
I know Resident Evil 4 was a multi-plat game and it's been ported to like a million consoles, but hot damn, I just can't get enough of this. I've played through Resident Evil 4 at least three times and I'm currently working on my fourth playthrough on Steam. Shooting down zombies with Leon is some of the most fun that could be had on the GameCube, if not the most fun shooter the console offers. I'm not even sure where I would start in terms of what I love the most about this game. Is it the freaking chainsaw guys? Is it El Gigante? Is it the merchant? Is it the dreaded village? I don't know! Now the controls aren't very fluid like a lot of third person shooters, and that was actually done with a purpose. The stiff controls make the game scarier because it's not quite as easy to aim and fire. Plus, having limited ammo forces you to be very conscious of where you shoot and how much you shoot. And can I just say, this is still the only zombie game that has zombie dogs that genuinely creep me out. If you've played the Labyrinth level, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Even navigating the menus is fun. The sound effects when you swap out weapons or move inventory around feels so satisfying. It shouldn't be this much fun to move things around a menu, but it is for some reason. The story is pretty cheesy, but that's exactly what you'd expect from Resident Evil, and I wouldn't want it any other way. I could honestly go on for hours and hours about how great this game is, but sadly we must move on to the top three. You knew Double Dash would make it onto the list somewhere. It's one of the more unique Mario Kart titles because of the ability to drive with two characters at once. It's not just a cosmetic feature. Each character has their own special items, like Mario and Luigi get fireballs, Donkey and Diddy Kong get bananas, Peach and Daisy gets hearts, and so on. It's kind of dumb that the Koopa Troopas and Wario slash Waluigi specials are basically just normal Mario Kart items, but those are just nitpicks if I'm being honest. And new to the game is customizable carts. There's lots of carts to choose from, each with their own unique speed acceleration and weight stats. Plus, there's the All Cup Tour, where you marathon every single track in one cup. It's surprising that this cup still hasn't been implemented into the newer Mario Kart titles. Like, what's up with that? The controls are definitely different from the other games, seeing as they're much more sensitive. But once you get used to them, it's one of the most ideal ways to play. Except there's no way to jump. Like, what? Double Dash also has some of the best Mario Kart tracks of all time, including stuff like Waluigi Stadium, Daisy Cruiser, and DK Mountain. The local multiplayer is also fantastic. The only thing that even compares to this is playing battle mode in Mario Kart 64. I've had an uncountable amount of great experiences and moments playing Double Dash with friends. Heck, you can even both share the same car and take turns driving and using items. That is the most ingenious co-op I've ever seen. And we haven't even gotten to the battle mode, which includes bob ohm Blast. Yes, the best mode ever. You can hurl bombs at your friends for points. Like, it just doesn't get better than that, okay? Similar to The Wind Waker, Super Mario Sunshine wasn't the most well-received game when it first released. A few people didn't like how different it was and that it only stuck with the beach theme. And now jump to 2018. Mario Sunshine is one of the highest praised Mario titles because it's so different. If only everyone knew that in 2002 we'd get 5 2D Mario games that all look and play exactly the same. But those times are over, the present is now, and we're gonna talk about one of the best games ever made. Most notable about Sunshine are the controls. Like holy crap are they refreshing? fine to death. Some might think they're a bit on the sensitive side, but once you get used to them, they're incredibly versatile. Jumping and moving works on the fly, the new spin jump is a hoot, and we haven't even talked about the flood pack yet. This is a nozzle that can transform and be used in different ways, like the hover nozzle lets you hover through the air, the rocket nozzle shoots you into the sky, and the turbo nozzle lets you sprint really fast, even across water. Because Nintendo limited themselves to the beach, every level is filled with creativity. You've got the hotel, the pier, the beach, and I guess guess this is like a vacation home? I'm not really sure. Now look, I've gushed about this game more than enough times. Let's just get on to number one. This is the one game that I've played consistently the most for several years. In fact, it was the very first game I played on the GameCube. Supra Smash Bros. Melee. It's Melee, man. You can't go wrong with this. It's the reason people call GameCube controllers the Melee controllers. The gameplay is so fast and tight. Yeah, a few of the characters are broken, but I don't care. It's so freaking fun. And then there's like a million new modes too. You got Adventure, an All-Star, a bajillion trophies to collect, Multi-Man Melee, the Home Run Contest, and even a random special movie. I've 
feel like this video was just like pro material back in the day, but it's still so relaxing to watch. And look at that menu, like hot mama. It's so clean and just beautiful. And the music, oh, it screams epic. And I know that comes off as kind of corny, but you know it's true, son. And them stages, oh, oh, they're so banging, dude. You can't tell me you haven't played Hyrule a thousand times because you most certainly have. And I haven't even mentioned event matches or the tournament mode or a special smash or all the new characters like Mewtwo, Marth, Mr. Game & Watch, Bowser, etc. And just look at that opening cutscene. God diggity bop, why is it still one of the most cinematic things I've ever seen in a video game? Whew, all right, I gotta go before my mind literally blows up from being so mind blown. Now a huge thank you to Party Game Bros for making this video possible through his support on Patreon. Feel free to check out his channel in the description. And a big thanks to everyone else that's supporting or has supported me on Patreon too. I deeply appreciate it. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed this and let me know in the comments what your favorite GameCube games are and why. Thanks so much for watching and I hope you have a smashing day.